Ecclesiastes 11:7. Truly the light is sweet and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. I want to stop right there and just talk about that for a moment. Um, there is a, uh, a neuro, I think he's a neuroscientist, neuroscientist, psychologist, some kind of person on, on YouTube. He's very popular. All of his posts get hundreds of thousands of views. And, and he talks about, basically he talks about ways to improve your life that are, that are, that are physiological, that are, that are based on science. And, and I, don't, I, don't, I don't follow him. I don't, I don't watch his posts. But he did have one pop up just a few weeks ago, and it said one simple step to make your day, um, make your day happier and more productive. I, something to words to that effect. And, and, and when I see those things, I'm curious to see if they do or don't line up with the Word of God. And I said, "Wow, one step to make my day, you know, happier and more productive. <laughs> I'll, I'll bite it, right?" So I watched it and. And it was very interesting because he said, he said, just try this and, and trust me, science, science backs all of this up. He said, but in the morning, as soon as the sun is above the horizon, go outside and take about five minutes. Don't stare at the sun, obviously, but, but get your eyes full of sunlight and, and kind of bask in that sunlight and see the world get bright with sunlight. Um, and that triggers the release of endorphins or serotonin or all of the above and and he said science has demonstrated that 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 sets your circadian rhythm and your clock and 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 shifts your brain to think hey it's daylight it's time to you know and, and and I've been doing that for the last month probably whenever the sun comes up I go out on the front porch for about five minutes and and just let the sun hit me and it really does it really does make a difference. Well, if I'd have been, if I'd have just gone to the Word of God and, and, you know, taken a close look at that, I'd have known that already. Truly the light is sweet and it is pleasant for the eyes to behold the sun. So here we have, uh, once again, science confirming the Word of God. Imagine, imagine that, right? Uh, but if a man lives many years and rejoices in them all, yet let him remember the dark days, the days of darkness, for they will be many. All that is coming is vanity. And here I think that word vanity means that it's foolish for us to place our trust in things of this world and to believe that Tomorrow's going to be just like today. It's going to be just like yesterday. Things are just going to continue without changing. Getting this kind of getting this attitude. Well, there's always tomorrow. You know, that's the world kind of says, well, there's always tomorrow. There's always tomorrow. Um, but there's not always tomorrow. And, and God is saying, even when your days are, especially, I think, when your days are full of joy, do enjoy them. Be thankful for them. Give God the glory for them. But no, it won't always be like that. Know that if you live long enough, there will be some rough times. I mean, even the world says, right, go, growing old is not for sissies. Isn't that what the world says? Uh -huh. yeah, Scotty used to say that all the time. Let him remember the days of darkness, for they will be many. So, again, we do need to rejoice we need to rejoice in all things. We need to give God honor and glory and thanksgiving in all things. But when times are good, we also need to remember that as much as I'm enjoying this, I know it's not going to last. Now, eventually, it's going to get better beyond my wildest imagination. But as long as I'm here in this flesh, um, I can count on there being times that are unpleasant. And he continues this theme uh, through much of chapter 12. 11, 9. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth, and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth. Walk in the ways of your heart and in the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these God will bring you into judgment. So he's clearly acknowledging that when we're young, you know, we're full of adrenaline, we're full of testosterone, you know, we just think we're going to be young forever, and we, we're 
we think we're twice as strong as we are, and and we just we're just full of vigor, um, full of um, virility, right? Um, and he says, enjoy that, rejoice in that. Just remember that if you use that foolishly, if you make poor choices. Um, God will bring all these things into judgment. So, so uh, again, this is all about, I think this is all, I'm sure this is all about us enjoying each season of our lives, making the most of each season of our lives. But even when we're young and, and you know, lustful and, and strong and virile and all that, we still need to remember that that we're making decisions and God will hold us accountable for them. Therefore, remove sorrow from your heart. When you're young, you don't really have any reason to be bored, to be angry, to be sorrowful. Remove sorrow from your heart. Put away evil from your flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. Here again, we see that word vanity used to mean it's going to come to an end. Enjoy it while you can. It's going to come to an end. And, and putting your trust in your youth, putting your trust in your virility, putting your trust in your strength, putting your trust in your manhood is foolishness because it, it too shall pass. And it's really not, it needs to not be what define you defines you. God sa uh, Jesus says, for a man is not, a man's life does not consist of what he owns. And so we need to, no matter how strong we are and how strong we feel, um, we need to be careful that we don't use that from evil, that we put evil away from our flesh. Childhood and youth are vanity. And this is a fascinating statement to me because, because our perception of childhood and youth changed a lot in the Western Hemisphere about 150 years ago, after the Civil War, during the period of the Victorian, this idea of childhood kind of got romanticized and we got into this kind of attitude that we should just let children have their way and let them run free and let them explore and let them, let them be children, right? The world says that, let, 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 let children be children. I think the world also says uh, children are to be seen and not heard, but that might be, <laughs> that might be an older, that might be an older, uh, an older statement. But but at this time, I mean, there was this, this notion that children were innocent, they were still learning, they were still growing up. But by the time you were 10 or 11 years old and you had enough of a back to work, uh, you were working. You were helping in the fields, you were helping in the factories, you were helping in the, in the shop, you were helping, you were working. And one of the reasons that, that families valued big families, lots of children, is because that was lots of help, lots of help with the chores. And, you know, up until, up until the last few generations, there were lots and lots of chores. When you raised your own chickens, or you raised your own cow, or you raised your own hog, or you raised your own kitchen garden, um, and you depended on those for food, most people today have no idea how much work that is to keep a garden half the size of this room weeded, to keep it weeded, to keep it watered, to pick the vegetables when they're ripe, to prepare them. Um, as recently as World War I, the average adult woman spent six hours a day in the kitchen. That's how long it took to clean those vegetables, to clean those chickens, to make sure the food was put up, make sure the food wasn't spoiled, to prepare it, to cook it, to keep a fire in the, in the oven, to prepare that food, to put meals on the table, six hours a day. And the most common cause of death in women was death from burning or the complications of fire because they wore these flouncy, cotton, untreated dresses and they cooked over, over fireplaces that were coal or wood or if you were really sophisticated, maybe gas, but they had open fires in them. And if you ever brushed that skirt against an open fire, by the time you could get out of that tight skirt and that corset and everything else, 
um, there was a good chance you had burned to death or, or, or suffered such burns that it would kill you. And we don't really appreciate that now. Um, and we should, we really should. But childhood and youth are vanity, even, even, even in that period when we cut children some slack and we did give children time to play and um, we, need to, we need to understand and they need to understand that that's fleeting and we can't put any faith in that. Remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the difficult days come. And the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. We are constantly praying that our children would come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ and make him Lord of their lives at an early age. We're constantly praying that children would be raised up by their parents in the fear and admonition of the Lord because the sooner we get into a right relationship with the Lord, the earlier in our life we will have the tools to cope with life's difficulties. And I don't know about anyone else in this room, I would not want to be a child growing up now. I mean, we talk regularly about how much things have changed in the last 50 years, but you know, we read about the number of, of young people, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 year old people committing suicide because, because their lives revolve around what's on the phone and, and every young lady thinks she's supposed to aspire to look like, I guess, Taylor Swift. And, and, and when they don't, or when people make fun of them, you know, they, don't, they don't, just don't have the tools, the emotional or the spiritual tools to cope with that. Remember now your Creator in the days of your youth. The younger we surrender and we need to and when we teach the youth and when we talk to the youth and we talk to young adults when we talk to men in jail when we talk to anybody I think we need to impress the fact that the sooner you come into that right relationship with God where he can bless you where he can hear your prayers where you can hear his voice and walk in the works he prepared for you and walk in the in the in the kind of living that he has for you not only not only will your life be more blessed and more abundant and more victorious but when those dark days do come when those difficulties come and they can come when you're young I mean you know difficulties aren't um, Satan doesn't say well I can't beat this one up yet he's not 40 years old so, my 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 first let's see I don't, I don't nephew my, my first nephew-in-law. Uh, my oldest niece got married 20 years ago and the young man she married died at the age of 29 of stomach cancer. Now hallelujah he was a he was a fervent spirit-filled Christian had no fear of dying of course he didn't want did, didn't like the idea of leaving Lauren behind a widow but but was an inspiration to everybody and it was not a pleasant it was not a pleasant death but again any of us the difficult days are going to come some of us are already experiencing more and more difficulties in our days well probably those are not going to get better and we know that at some point, if we live long enough, they're going to get worse. And you say, I have no pleasure in them. The point might come, we've known, we've known, we've known some people that have just, they've been angry at God for letting them continue to live um, because they felt like their lives were so unpleasant. And the day, then the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. While the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, while you can still see, and the clouds do not return after the rain, in the days when the keepers of the house tremble and the strong men bow down, when the grinders cease because they are few, and those that look through the windows grow dim, when the doors are shut in the streets and the sound of grinding is low, when one rises up at the sound of a bird, and all the daughters of music are brought low, also they are afraid of height 
and of terrors in the way. When the almond tree blossoms, the grasshopper is a burden and desire fails. For man goes to his eternal home and the mourners go about the streets. I think this whole passage is just is not talking about a city that's under siege or a city that's in severe economic decline. It's an allegory for us just having less and less strength, less and less will, less and less desire, you know, less of that those endorphins and those and those serotonins and those other neurotransmitters and uh, testosterone and and adrenaline and everything else and we just become tired. We just we just become old. Yeah, yeah, exactly. 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 God designed our bodies that way. These things are going to happen. Um, God is reminding us that those things are going to happen and telling us to prepare for those. Have a right relationship with God now where those things don't destroy us. They don't discourage us. They don't make us bitter. Chapter 12, verse 6. Remember your Creator before the silver cord is loosed, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the well, then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. Um, I think these are euphemisms for, for death. The silver cord is loose, the golden bowl is broken, the pitcher shattered at the fountain, or the wheel broken at the wheel, the wheel broken at the well. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Remember your creator before then. Um, once, once you die, there is no opportunity for repentance. There is no opportunity to bear fruit. There's no opportunity to, to say, oh, 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 I changed my mind. I want to surrender to the Lord and get baptized. There's that, that, that opportunity has come and gone. And, and God gives that opportunity to everyone. And remember your Creator before, before. In fact, remember your Creator. The earlier the dead, remember now your Creator in the days of your youth. The earlier, the better. And although right now I'm called to spend time with men in jails, there are some very young people in jails. But I certainly need to be supporting and encouraging and praying for those who are called to be ministering, witnessing, and teaching our children and youth that as many as would will surrender their lives, place their trust in God at an early, at an early age. The, the earlier the better. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher, all is vanity. Again, vanity to think that, I mean, even at my age or your age or any of our age, to think that things are just going to continue. I've, I've got more time, I've got more days. God doesn't promise us any more time. God doesn't promise us any more days. And, and it is a foolish thing to put off entering into a right relationship with the Lord. Uh, I find it particularly frightening when I hear a man say, and I've heard this a number of times in the jail, well, you know, I'm just not, I'm just not ready. I'm just, I'm just, you know, God's going to want me to quit doing this and quit doing this and quit doing this. And I'm just not ready. I'll, I'm going to wait a few more years. And then my experience is that if you can have that, if you can know the truth and have that attitude, when probably never will come. You'll just continue to want to put it off and put it off and put it off. Um, instead of what Peter says is, which we, we have lived enough of that life. We've lived enough, time to put it away, time to, we've, we've, we've lived for the devil more than enough already. It's time to surrender. 
And moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. The preacher sought to find acceptable words, and what was written was upright, words of truth. The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of scholars like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. What, what I see here is that Solomon certainly went through a period in his life when he was not very wise. We read over in the 11th chapter of First Kings that when he was older, his wives turned his heart away from him and caused him to build idols to other gods. And then it says, and God became angry with Solomon. Um, but there was a period in, in, Sol, in Solomon's life where he was very wise and he wrote things, the book of Proverbs or much of the book of Proverbs that are very wise and, and when it says the words of scholars are like well-driven nails and this word scholars by the way that's just, it's the actual literal translation of the Hebrew is masters of the assemblies so it means teachers Teachers. It means those who are supposed to know enough to be able to 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 keep a spiritual um, have respons uh, spiritual responsibility and authority for the flock. And when he was in that role, um, he wrote very wise things, but like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. Shepherd with a capital S, even in the Hebrew. So God. Jesus Christ, God, the Holy Spirit, has seen to it that what, that what Solomon wrote that was, in fact, wise, made it into our Bible. So if he wrote things that were unwise, God saw to it that they didn't end up in, our, in his word that we have today. And further, my son, be admonished by these, of making many books there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. Don't overthink the gospel, because it is really simple, it is really straightforward. We need to believe in our hearts and confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ as the Messiah as the anointed one, as the one who came to die on the cross for our sins. We need to seek him. We need to try and walk in obedience to him. And then we will have a right relationship with God. We'll be prepared for the dark days that come. We'll have lives filled with blessing and joy and thanksgiving. It's that simple. We don't need to complicate it. And, you know, this was written 2,000 years ago. Um, <laughs> And it's only gotten worse. You could fill this room many times over with all the books that people have written telling us what they think the Bible says or what they think it might have originally meant or what they think we can disregard today or what, we, or what my interpretation is. Um, and of making many books, there's no end and in much study is worrisome to the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring in every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Once again, we will get judged for our actions. We'll get judged for our words. If we are in Christ, we'll not be condemned but we will be judged. And the whole point of this book is what he's telling us is the whole point of, book, of this book is life is vanity. Therefore, what should be important to us is that we fear God and keep his commandments. We're going to live here a short period of time. We're going to die. This is going to go back to dust where it came from. And our spirit is going to live forever. And where it lives is going to be a function of whether or not we decided during our lives to believe in and confess the Lord Jesus Christ. The younger we do that in our lives, the better our lives 
will be. And the more opportunity we'll have to bear fruit and to lay up treasures in heaven. And that's, well, we've said that in a lot of different ways, but that's the bottom line. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is man's all.